Uh, thank you, Uncle. That was a, a nice introduction I've ever had in my life. Um, Auntie, first of all, um, to you and your family, my deepest condolences. Um, I haven't met you before, but uh, it really um, uh, it's devastating to hear about the loss of someone so young, at such, at such a young age. And um, I honor the responsibility that you've given for me today to talk to the community about heart health um, and how we can pre potentially prevent this from happening uh, to other members of our community. And, and that's what I tried to do uh, today um, to the IESL. Uh, New South Wales chapter and Dumbik uncle and all involved uh, organizing this. I'd like to thank you uh, as well. Um, so basically today, my plan is to talk to you about heart health, about what uh, can go wrong, what the warning signs are, and what we can do as a community to improve our own heart health um, and how to look out for one another. And that's what I'd like to do um, in the talk today. And part of the reason that this is so important is because Sri Lankan community and the South Asian migrant community in Australia are disproportionately affected by heart disease and ischemic heart disease. Um, I work at Westmead Hospital. Uh, I did all my training there. I've seen people as young as 28, 30 years old, come in with heart attacks um, from Sri Lankan, Fiji, Indian backgrounds. It doesn't surprise me at all. Often they're from South Asian backgrounds and um, there's something going on there. And I think um, attention needs to be uh, kind of put to this community to see what we can do to improve uh, our outcomes. So this is a, a graph from a study published from the UK Biobank. So the UK Biobank uh, had 500,000 people um, that were enrolled from 2000 to 2006. And they looked at 8,000 people in, in the UK who were from a South Asian background. Now they lump us all together, uh, Indian, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. And you know that we all have different traits and different qualities, but Let's pretend for now that we're all South Asian. And you can see that as time goes on, if you follow from zero to 12 years, the incidence of cardiovascular disease increases. So we are at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And the question is, why is this happening? We know that we are at two times the risk of cardiovascular disease than uh, a European population in the UK. We are 2.3 times higher risk of having a heart attack. 2.3 times higher risk of having a fatal heart attack and 1.3 times higher risk of having a stroke. The odds are against us and we need to think about how we can look after our own health and look after our community to improve these outcomes. And this is a, a graph that's really complicated, but I think it's important to look at. Um, so we'll start with the top. So this graph describes the risk of having a cardiovascular event for a South Asian person compared to the European cohort in that same study. And the hazard ratio is two. So you can think of it as two times higher risk of having a cardiovascular event. And you might ask, why is that? Is that because we have more diabetes? Is that because we have more high blood pressure? Maybe we have more fat. Well, let's look. If we control and we adjust for the fact that we have more high blood pressure, still our risk is 1.95 times higher than the European population. If we adjust for diabetes, our risk is still 1.7 times higher. If we adjust for obesity, especially central obesity, a weight around the tummy, uh, inflammatory disease, still 1.5 times higher. Cholesterol, inflammatory disease, family history, a sedentary lifestyle, psychosocial stresses, socioeconomic measures, we still are at about a 1.5 times higher risk. There's something going on and, and knowing that we're behind the eight ball, we do need to be vigilant about our heart health. And we need to, you know, take every opportunity to be uh, to to get the help that we need. I think that's important. So today, I want to talk to you about what a heart attack is, and that's important because it informs the treatments and the tests that we have. I want to talk to you about risk because it all comes down to risk uh, when we manage our patients, and I want to talk to you about concrete steps to improve your heart health. Um, and that's the pleasure for me today, because a lot of these discussions I have on a repeat basis every time a patient walks through my door. But now I get to talk to so many of you here and on Zoom um, and, and, you know, it's very efficient. Um, so what is a heart attack? Well, we think about atherosclerosis, which is a long and um, difficult to say term, but really it's about fat that gets deposited in the walls of the arteries. And let's, because I'm talking to an engineer, Association who 
understand um, you know mechanisms and I was told they like to think about signals and 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 things like that. Let's let's look at atherosclerosis. So if I was to draw a blood vessel kind of in a long axis and then I look at it end on, right? So the light pink is the inner lumen of the heart. That's where the blood vessels, the blood cells go through and the blood flows through. And the dark red is the wall of the heart. And I also draw it. So I, I took this from YouTube. It's a really nice figure. Um, there's a link there. If you, if you go, you can watch the whole um, the, the figure to understand. So on the bottom here, you have the, the blood uh, vessel wall. And on the top, you have uh, the, the lumen where the blood flows. So inside the lumen, you have cholesterol that floats around. You have white blood cells. You have red blood cells, which carry oxygen to the uh, our tissue. Okay. And, and what happens is we get damaged to the inner wall lining of the heart. This happens for many reasons. Diabetes causes abnormal glucose products, which damage, damage the wall. High blood pressure causes release of vasoreactive um, uh, hormones that damage the walls. We know a lot of weight from fat around the tummy um, uh, releases adipokines and, and again, hormones that damage these walls. Inflammatory disease, smoking, and what happens is when you get damaged walls, your white blood cells will filter through the cracks into the wall of the heart. And these um, purple lipid cells, fat cells will also filter in and they interact in a bad way. The white blood cells eat the fat, um, smooth muscle cells eat the fat and they, they digest and they become this new thing called foam cells. And these cells die and accumulate in the wall, and you suddenly get an outpouching of disease into the wall of the heart. And that causes, if my slide will go forward, atherosclerotic disease. So that's the atherosclerotic plaque that you get. Here we go. Uh, so this man, William Pepperden, in 1772, described angina. And what he said is it's a central chest pain that gets worse when you walk, when you walk up a hill, when you do something physical, and it stops and settles down when you rest. It goes away when you rest. Classic heart caused chest pain. And the reason that happens is you get obstruction in the blood vessel, okay? Not enough that when you're resting and sitting, the blood can't flow, but when you're moving and exercising, the, there's not enough space for the blood to reach the muscle of the heart and you get pain. That's angina, that's cardiac chest pain. Very typical. Worse when you exercise, settles when you rest, um, classic central pain. And, and he described that it goes to the left arm, which is another, another sign that often uh, lay people know. But the story is more complicated than that, okay? When you look at the plaque, there's different kinds of plaque. You get plaque with this big fibrous cap. It's a protective cap. Okay, it, it contains and walls everything in. And you get plaque with a thin fibrous cap. This is not protective cap. This is the dangerous plaque that can cause heart attacks. Okay? And when you have a heart attack, when we say you had sudden chest pain that came on at rest, that took you to hospital, that mean someone needed to do something quite urgently for you, that's when the plaque ruptures, it breaks. And the blood cells capture and attach onto the, the, the plaque, and then suddenly you get no flow. You get zero flow, and the heart muscle dies. That is the problem. That is what we're trying to treat. That is what we're trying to stop, okay? And it's classically pain at rest. If you're having pain at rest, it is a problem. You must call an ambulance, okay? These are pictures of arteries. And this is just to show you there's different mechanisms. So here, the first panel on the left, this is the cholesterol plaque, and you get a little bit of damage to it, and all of a sudden you get blood clotting on top, okay? And you get a little bit of, only a little bit of space for the blood to flow through. In the second one, this cap has completely ruptured, and all of a sudden the blood cells have attached here and then filled the whole lumen. You have had no blood flow. This patient has had no blood flow. And this is stable, okay? So you may know people, or you may be, have been told, you have a blockage, a 50% blockage, a 70% blockage. If you're not getting chest pain at rest, that is stable. That is not a heart attack. 
And often it does not need a stent. It could be 90% and it doesn't need a stent. Often we can manage this with medications. What we want to do is treat the patient, not the blockage, okay? And I'll talk to you about that. And this is what happens, unfortunately. You get a blockage, you get damage to the wall of the heart, and you get changes on the ECG. And, and this can cause, often people nowadays actually survive heart attack, um, but quite significant severe ones um, lead to cardiac arrest, uh, as unfortunately happened. But the point of this talk is to talk about warning signs and symptoms. So if you're getting chest pain, if you're getting pain in your arms, shoulders, back, neck, jaw, that's classic cardiac heart chest pain, okay? This is from the Heart Foundation of Australia. It's a fantastic website. There's lots of really good quality patient information on it. You may also feel short of breath, dizzy, sweaty, nauseous and sick, um, but often it's the chest pain, okay? And the other thing is women and men are not the same. Up to 30% of patients can present without this classic chest pain and they get misdiagnosed. They get told they have reflux. They get sent, sent home from the GP or from the ED and unfortunately something happens to them later that night. Okay, so if you know something's wrong, you must always go back to the hospital, okay? You must never go home with pain. Pain must be settled before you leave a medical professional. Women are more likely to have middle chest pain or upper back pain, neck pain, jaw pain, um, rather than the classic central squeezing, squeezing pain. You have patients who tell you they feel like an elephant is sitting on their chest. That's classic pain, but not everyone has it. So don't wait for that, okay? What happens? You call triple zero. You don't drive into hospital like some of my patients have done. You don't um, wait to see your GP the next morning. If you have pain, you go to hospital and you get checked out. Now I'll tell you what they do in hospital. It is not that it's an inconvenience, especially if you go uh, to a very busy ED in the middle of the night, but it is, it is often life-saving. So we'll talk about treatment and tests. So if you call an ambulance, the paramedics will come and they'll do an ECG for you. And immediately from that ECG, they can make sure you're not having a terrible bad heart attack um, because they'll see changes straight away. They'll give you aspirin. They'll give you 300 milligrams of aspirin. Often it's in water, it's dissolvable and you can drink it, okay? And they'll give you a spray under your tongue, a spray or a tablet under your tongue. And what this, what this does is it opens up the blood vessels as much as possible to help. You'll go to hospital and they'll do multiple ECGs. They'll do ECG after another, after another, because they're looking for changes that happen over time. Some people get chest pain and it goes away and they get it again and it goes away and they get it again and it goes away and it's building, it's crescendo. We call it crescendo. And that is a sign. So you have to monitor the patient very carefully because you may capture the heart attack as it is happening, as you've done in this patient. So this is a normal ECG, the heart attack is happening and it's happened here, okay? They'll do blood tests, a test called a proponent. Um, and they'll do one and they'll repeat it again an hour to three hours later. And what they're looking for is a change. Troponin is, a, is, is something that's found inside your heart muscle cells. And so when they die, it gets released and we can measure it. And if you measure it, you can tell if someone's having a heart attack, it will continue to rise. And they'll look for other reasons. Not everyone with chest pain is having a heart attack. There's many reasons why. So they'll do x-rays and other things. Okay. And the main reason that I talked about atherosclerosis is to talk about what a heart attack is. There's two types. There's a heart attack that completely blocks and affects the wall of the heart and the whole wall of the heart. And you have a big heart attack. We call that a STEMI. Those patients, no matter the middle of the night, no matter what time it is, they get taken into the um, lab within 90 minutes of presentation and they get an angiogram to try and fix it. Okay, the ones who have a, still have blood flow, it gets managed with medicines and they get an angiogram the next day or the day after. So you have time. And what does the doctor do? They do an angiogram. These are the arteries that, that um, are in the heart. There's two sets. There's one on the right, the right coronary, and there's a left-sided system that is the left main that breaks into two arteries, the left circumflex, and the left anterior descending. It's good to know if you know you have blockages where they are, because we worry about blockages in the left main 
and in the, the front start of the LED. They're the really bad ones. The rest of them, generally, you can manage okay. And basically, we put wires through the wrist or through the groin into the heart, and we slide them into these arteries, and we squirt dye, and we take pictures with an X-ray. This is an example. So this patient, looking at the right coronary artery, when they squirt a dye through this catheter, it stops. It doesn't flow on. And then after they fixed it, you can see this is the, the main artery. All of this part of the heart would not have had blood flow. And that's what you're trying to be fixed urgently within 90 minutes. This is why you don't wait to see your doctor the next day. This is why you go straight away. Okay. And to fix it, you put a wire across the blockage. You use a balloon to open it up. And then you use a stent. And I think of a stent like the spring of a ballpoint pen. You deploy it and it keeps everything nice and open. Some people can't have stents and they need bypass surgery. So that's open heart surgery. You open the chest and uh, you take um, blood vessels to bypass the, re the, the lesions. That's, the recovery from that is a bit more difficult, but there are certain people that do better with bypass surgery than stents. If you have lots of blockages, you don't want to have a lot of stents. Okay? If you have diabetes, often the surgery is better than a stent. And then you get given treatment that you must take. So if you've had a heart attack and you have a stent, you get given two blood thinners to take for 12 months and one blood thinner, aspirin, you take for the rest of your life, no matter what. And you stop it only if a heart specialist gives you the okay, because otherwise the stent itself can get blocked. You take a cholesterol medication called a statin, and there's lots of rumors and myths about statins, which I'll talk about today. And often you take a few other medications, but it's not, the medications are really important, but it's really the lifestyle that have caused the problem that we need to address alongside it. And the education that's just as important as giving someone a script. The script is the easy part. The behavioral change is the hard. So cholesterol tablets do a couple of things and really amazing things. Number one, they drop the cholesterol, okay? And we target low levels of cholesterol in the body. If you're at high risk, we, give an, we target an LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, less than 1.8. So if you have high risk and you know you have, you have stents and things, often that's a, that's the mark where I tell my patients. But what they do, and the reason I spend all this time showing the atherosclerosis, is they stabilize that plaque. They stop it from rupturing. That's the reason, even if your cholesterol goes down, if you're at high risk, you must still take the cholesterol tablet. It's not just about the number. There's a dose that you take because it protects that plaque from breaking. Okay, and that's new evidence that we're getting. And there's a lot of evidence. This is a graph that shows a lot of studies that have uh, been attempting to treat cholesterol. And they show with reduction of, in cholesterol, you get reduction in cardiovascular events. There's myths about dementia. I suspect often the people with dementia are the ones who have lived longer because they've been given statins. And as you age, you get dementia. Okay, um, there's myths about or not mixed, but one of the problems with using statins is that it causes muscle aches and pains. Does anyone take a statin? Yeah, I'm sure people do. And often you get told before you start to take it that you can get muscle aches and pains in your body. Now, how many people in the in the audience have muscle aches and pains and don't take a statin? Uh, me? Yeah? We often do. And if we, when we warn patients that you will get muscle aches and pains, and we do need to because one in 10 can, often people who just have general muscle aches and pains attribute to the statin and this important medication gets stopped. And this is a really interesting study. So what they did was they took 60 patients and they said, for a couple of weeks, take a statin, couple of weeks, take a normal medication, sugar pill, couple of weeks, take a statin again, couple of like, you know, alternate at random. And what they showed was these people, no matter what they took, they had pain. Okay, they probably just had muscle aches and pains. These people who thought they had muscle aches and pains when they took a cholesterol tablet didn't get it again when they started. And these people had muscle aches and pains when they took the sugar pill sometimes and when they took the cholesterol pill sometimes. So there is a mental effect to being told this. Um, and we need to tease it out as doctors. Often we reduce the dose, we cancel on the importance, we really try and treat the underlying causes of muscle aches and pains, and then we see how things go. But yes, one in 10 people can't tolerate it well, and there are lots of options to use instead. 
If you get to hospital and you get told that you haven't had a heart attack because they've done the blood test, great news, okay? But you've had chest pain and you need to see your family doctor and then you often get sent to a specialist and they will do certain tests, okay? They might do a treadmill test, uh, get you to run a treadmill to see how you go and see whether you get chest pain. They might do a CT scan where they give dye through a drip and they see if there are blockages. They might do an ultrasound of the heart, which is here. And, and to see if the heart muscle is working and, and, and pumping well, okay? The problem is a lot of these tests often lead to overdiagnosis and worry, and unfortunately sometimes lead to stents when you didn't need them, okay? If you haven't had a heart attack, it's, if you've had a heart attack, it's different. It needs to be open, it needs to be fixed. You need a stent or you need bypass surgery or medicine because neither are good options. If you haven't had a heart attack, stents don't, aren't always necessary. We used to think that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you see a blockage of 70, 80%, we put a stent in. You think about a pipe that runs from your house, you know, into the sewer. If you get an 80, 90% blockage, your water's not going. What are you going to do? You're going to call the plumber and put a stent, like fix it somehow um, or replace that pipe. But here, your know, blood vessel is a dynamic thing. It can open and close. It reacts to things. You know, it can bypass radial tributaries. So you don't need to put stents in just because someone has a blockage of 80, 90%. And this is a really interesting trial. It was called the COURAGE trial because it took courage to do. Um, they took patients who had significant blockages and they uh, decided not to stent them. They gave them medicines, good quality medicines. And the, the number of deaths was exactly the same. Then someone said, oh, maybe it's because you haven't picked the ones who have really bad blockages. You need to do another study where you do another test first to prove the blockage is really bad. So they repeated it, and again, there was no benefit in stents. In people who have stable symptoms, that is people who only have chest pain when they're exercising, but not at rest, better to use medicines than a stent. And it obviously um, depends on where the blockages are and there's a nuance to it, but in general. So I'm saying this so you don't get worried if you have a test and you get told you get a blockage and you wonder, oh, doctor told me I have a 60% blockage. What do I do now? It's often best managed with medicines. We're not trying to find the blockage. We're trying to find the vulnerable patient and to treat and manage that patient. It's all about risk, okay? So these are some of the risk factors. Um, physical inactivity, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, age, family history, race and ethnicity, and I talked about the South Asian population. Smoking, I haven't done any slides on. We all know smoking is bad. Um, I tell my patients, it's like uh, you're trying to put out a, a house on fire and you have someone else in the back, you know, uh, throwing you know, cinder blocks into it. You can't fix it if you're going to keep smoking. You need to stop. Um, but there are risk factors that are modified, risk factors that we can affect from a young age in the 10s, 20, 30s, 40, 50s. And we know atherosclerosis starts from childhood. You know, they did studies of... of, of um, ultrasound studies of the necks of, of children and they found there was atherosclerosis. It starts from a very young age, so we need to do it from a young age. It's not something you can wait till you're 50, 60 to start to think about. And we also know there are non-standard factors, and auntie wanted me to touch on this, to talk about stress, to talk about sleep, to talk about um, worry, mental health, to talk about occupational exposures, if you talk about air pollution, all of these have an effect. We know women who had gestational diabetes or preeclampsia when they had children are at a higher risk of having heart disease. And that's not captured in our traditional risk factors. Okay, so it's important to think a lot about traditional and non-traditional risk factors, non-standard factors. This is a study done in The Lancet, uh, which is a very large medical journal. And it said that suboptimal diet is responsible for more deaths than any other risk globally including smoking. Suboptimal diet is one of the biggest problems. It also leads to um, often um, you know, animals dying, it leads to deforestation because of the ultra-processed foods that we're consuming, but it also leads to death. Um, 11 million deaths in 2017 attributable, attributable to poor diet alone. And these are the, the significant factors of, of, of your diet that lead to death. So mainly diet high in sodium, a diet low in whole grains, low in fruits, low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables, omega-3 fatty acids. There was a trend in the past to use fish oil. You know, we suggest fish oil for people who have high triglycerides. But we know that the, the, the um, omega-3 fatty acids that you consume through seafood 
it's paradoxically better for you than the tablets that you um, may take, which are supercharged. You know, there's krill oil tablets that they have thousands and thousands of milligrams. It's the, it's the natural food that you eat that's often better for you than the tablets. Okay, it's an important um, thing to remember. And so if you Google how to eat well, Heart Foundation, there's a three-page document which I've um, um, used uh, and, and has really, really good quality information um, that's easily acceptable. So they suggest a diet with plenty of fruit, vegetables, whole grain cereals, healthy proteins, fish, seafood, legumes, nuts, seeds, um, unflavored milk, yogurts, and cheese. And if you have high cholesterol, there are options with um, uh, plant sterols, and, and these can lower, so certain margarines, certain margarines um, can help to lower the cholesterol. Healthy fat choices. So uh, we talk about healthy fats, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats, and unhealthy fats, the really bad ones in America where you get, you know, dip, uh, quick uh, crackers and biscuits and puddings with trans fats, they're horrible for you. And then there's saturated fats, which are often from animal products, kind of in between. So choosing healthy fats, and often trying to use herbs and spices, it's a very easy process for Lankans, um, to flavor our food instead of adding salt. And they say, um, uh, eat no more than seven eggs a week. I always get asked, how many eggs can I have? No more than seven eggs a week um, if you have high cholesterol or heart disease or diabetes, so if you have higher risk. Um, and I also always get asked um, what oils to cook with. Um, and often we suggest olive oils are okay at medium, at, at low temperatures, um, olive oil, and then at medium temperatures, uh, canola oil, peanut oil, sunflower oil um, is, is okay to use. Uh, that's the suggestion. And your plate should look like this. Mine doesn't always, um, but it would be nice. I wish it did. It looks delicious. Um, you know, a quarter of your plate is whole grains, you know, like quinoa or whole grain brown rice. A half your plate is vegetables, colorful vegetables. You get a quarter from a protein, healthy protein, and then you add flavor. And there are other diets. Mediterranean diet is the most evidence-based one. Um, you can Google it. The DASH diet is another evidence-based one, and, and there's a book about it. Um, and also, I think, you know, traditional vegetarian, vegan diets, uh, you know, if you're careful about the proteins that you're consuming and you don't go to the ultra-processed soy products, that's also pretty healthy. Most traditional diets rich in whole grains you know, healthy fruits and vegetables are good. And I think it's self-evident. You don't need me to tell you that. We know that. It's ultra-processed foods, which are more and more insidious in what we're eating, that it's a problem. And we know that regardless of calorie intake, just ultra-processed foods are horrible for you. But I'm talking to Sri Lankans. So let's look at a study about Sri Lankans. Uh, this was a study that looked at food consumption of Sri Lankan adults. Uh, it was done uh, by Ranil Jayawardene um, in Sri Lanka. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because they basically took all the foods that Sri Lankans like to eat and they broke it down into, it's like I love cotton roti, and they broke it down into like, uh, you know, paratha, which is flour and oil and meat. And they tried to estimate serving sizes from what they're eating. So they were told in the community, you know, I have one plate of cotton roti. They tried to figure out what the energy was. And if you go to the supplementary index, you can see what that is, which is interesting. Um, 60, they did 490 interviews, 60% from rural areas. And um, uh, what, they, what they saw was that we're consuming too much starch. So they recommend six to 11 um, portions of starch. And the average consumption was 14. 70% um, of adults exceeded the maximum daily recommendation of starch. I know I probably did today when I ate my plate of rice. Um, and they look at what they just said. The average uh, person's meal in Sri Lanka comprises of three quarters of a plate of rice with a small amount of vegetable curry um, a small piece of meat or fish and some starchy curry such as potato or lentils. And we've all done that. And we all enjoy that. But that is a problem in terms of what we're eating. It's not the, the balanced diet that I showed you the Heart Foundation is telling us. And, and I suspect that's probably contributing somewhat to the high risk, especially here when we're busy and time poor and we go to what we're used to and, and, and comfort food and this is what we, what we eat. There are some studies that have looked at Sri Lankans and South Asians in the Western world, so migrants. Um, these are three that I found. So one was looking at migrants in New Zealand, and they looked at what the change was from when they were in uh, South Asia to uh, when they came. Um, none of them focused on Sri Lankans only. One of them um, uh, 
um, protests with um, uh, uh, Bhutan, and they combined the two. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, so when you look at the first study, they showed that when we come to Western world, we actually, even though we weren't eating much fruits and vegetables, um, only 3.5% ate enough fruits and vegetables um, as per the recommendations in Sri Lanka on that study. 3.5%. Right? When we come to a Western world, we suddenly eat less fruits and vegetables, but we eat more processed meats. We eat more ice cream paradoxically. We still eat our curd and yogurt, but then we add other dairy products on top, like cheeses, that which we may not have eaten as much of, um, and processed cheeses, like craft cheese, which a lot of us like to eat. Um, and we get reductions in our healthy lentils and legumes. Um, but then as we kind of settle in, apparently we go back to eating more healthy and our second and third generation start to, to change again and, and, and have more of a balanced plate. And I think we see that as well uh, uh, in, in younger generations. On the right, I've shown the risk factors for um, uh, people of uh, um, Sri Lankan uh, descent, I think in Queensland, sorry, so South and Southeast Asians living in Sydney. So that's us, right, South, Southeast Asian migrants living in Sydney. And we know that about a quarter of us have history of high blood pressure. About a fifth of us have diabetes. Um, more than half of us have a family history of high blood pressure. And um, we know that at least half of us are overweight. Um, and, and these are things that we need to address and fix. So let's talk about physical inactivity. Physical activity is planned, structured, and repetitive. Um, often you will do work uh, and physical activity in your workplace. You know, you may find stairs, you may be on your feet the whole time, but that doesn't count as physical activity. That counts as something called NEAT. Um, so these are non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's expenditure of calories that aren't physical activity. NEATs are very important because about 70% of what you, you um, expend is from NEATs. So apart from exercising, you know, taking the stairs, parking further away, playing with your kids, vacuuming, cleaning the house, that all counts. But you still need to focus on the recommended physical activity. And that's uh, one and a half hours of in high intensity exercise. That means if your heart rate goes up and you breathe more heavily at the end, you're panting a little bit, or two and a half hours a week of moderate intensity exercise, or you can mix and match. And that's the current recommended guidelines, and it's about behavioral changes and finding the time. Um, I find it hard as well. This was a really interesting study. I really like this study. So they looked at about 111,000 people, and they looked at their uh, wearables, because everyone has wearables now, and they have smart watches and, and iPhones, and everyone knows their step count. Um, and, and what they looked at was, is there a step count that helps you to live longer? Is there a step count where you your risk of dying goes down. And they found that the step count was 2,500 steps, which I loved. 2,500 steps, I think we all do, it's not very hard. So if you walk that much, you start to live longer. The optimum dose, so the dose and the curve where you know that you've kind of efficiently achieved your reduction in mortality is 8,000 steps, which doesn't seem as hard as, you know, I think everyone tries to think about reaching 10,000 steps. I, I, that's what all my patients mentioned, you know, I did 10,000 steps. Um, and as you keep going, the risk reduces. And also the cadence, how fast you walk, affects it. So if you walk faster with your step count and slower, there's further reduction. It's the same for uh, um, cardiovascular disease, just reduction of cardiovascular disease, not just death. So about 8,000 steps at least, I think, is what we should be thinking and targeting as a community, knowing that we're behind the eight ball, we have odds against us. So the message is sit less, move more. Diabetes. Uh, this is a study of Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka, um, looking at uh, diabetes across age. We know that about 23% of Sri Lankans have diabetes in 2019. And we know that it's a disease that affects affluent people. The higher your socioeconomic status, the more diabetes you have. Because I think the diet that you have, you know, the, the time, maybe your time, you, or you may think about your time, differently, I don't know, but the more affluent, the higher the rates of diabetes. And I think, I suspect, I haven't seen the data weight as well. So we know in Australia, in Sydney, us, 
about 20% of us have diabetes or personal history of diabetes. It doubles the risk of heart disease. It can affect many organs, not just your heart, your brain, your kidneys, your eyes, blood vessels in the legs. Um, everyone uh, should be aware of something called the HbA1c. So HbA1c uh, looks at the number of sugar molecules that are attached to the blood. So your blood cells live for three months and then they die. If we measure a blood cell and we measure how many sugar molecules are attached, in general, we can get an idea of what the sugar levels have been like for the last three months. It's much better than a random blood sugar reading that you get or once off, okay? Um, and in general, if you have diabetes, the target is less than seven. If you have a target, if you have an HbA1c more than 6.5, more than once, you have diabetes. Um, and then between six and 6.5, you're kind of on your way. We think about pre-diabetes. And there's other tests that you can do as well, but I kept it a little bit simple. And this was a study done um, in Sri Lanka by an Australian PhD, an Australian slash Sri Lankan PhD student who took patients with diabetes and randomized them. To get a third of them, he gave them aerobic exercise, a third of them weight training, and a third of them did nothing. Okay. And he found that in patients with diabetes who have really badly controlled diabetes, you suddenly saw a reduction in your HbA1c just with exercise. So it goes to show it's not just about medications. The message is always the same. Exercise, watching what you eat, um, uh, sitting less, moving more, that is what is beneficial. Um, high blood pressure is the same thing. Um, we know that targets of about 130 on 80 um, are really what we want to achieve. And I'd like to tell my patients, if you have a blood pressure machine at home, um, to take your blood pressure on your right arm and your left arm. And often the higher one is the one that you'll continue to check. I often tell them to sit for a while after you've got the machine out because, you know, sometimes machines are hard to operate and then you, your blood pressure will go up a little bit as you try and fiddle with it. Often I tell them to not to worry about the first reading. The second and third reading are a bit more accurate. And you don't need to check your blood pressure every day. It's not a daily, I need to monitor morning and night what my blood pressure is doing. But it's nice to have a trend of what it's doing before you see a GP, for example. If you know morning, noon, and night, what it's done for the last three or four days, you have about 20 readings to give your GP. And that's often much, much better than a one single reading that you get from a GP. Because often people have white coat hypertension, white coat blood pressure. You see a doctor and your blood pressure goes up. I don't know why. Um, and again, I feel like a broken record, but the message is exactly the same. So any tablet that you take that can reduce your blood pressure generally will reduce your average blood pressure by about six millimeters of mercury. So if you're 140, it will go to 134. Okay. If you do physical exercise, aerobic physical exercise, which is recommended, it drops by the exact same amount. Prescribing physical exercise is the equivalent of prescribing the tablet. Okay. If you go on the DASH diet, it drops by double that, 11 millimeters. To reduce the amount of salt that you take to less than 2.3 grams in a day. Again, um, all of these things can add, moderate the amount of alcohol that you drink. These are ways to affect your lifestyle and your health without taking a tablet. Tablets are needed. I use them all the time, but you need to do put in the work to have um, good, good benefits. Cholesterols are hard. Um, it's not just about the cholesterol number. It's not just about having cholesterol of six or seven or eight to decide treatment. I often use your risk. So what is your risk? We know that if you have a high risk, regardless of your cholesterol, so if you're a 70-year-old diabetic or 65-year-old diabetic, often you need a cholesterol tablet or some dose. If you have heart disease and we know you have blockages, you need a cholesterol tablet, even if your cholesterol is normal, because we know that it has other benefits. It stabilizes the plaque. That's why I spend the time showing you the plaque, okay? And moderate disease, it's a line ball call, and we do little fancy things like CT scans, look at the calcium in your body. And we know weight is a problem. So when I was in school, we were told that the healthy BMI, um, you know, overweight over 25, obese over 30. I wish it was true, it's not. Um, the WHO says that for Sri Lankans, the BMI target is 23, not 25. So we need to be lower than the, uh, um, the rest of the population in Australia. And we know that over time, so this is death in 1990, death in 2015, as our body max index has shifted to the right, the number of deaths have increased as well. The BCD is killing us. And this was even a more devastating study for me, and I found this today, this morning. 
um, another study in Sri Lanka where they looked at body weight, and they actually showed that you get higher blood sugars, higher blood pressure, high triglycerides when your BMI is over 21.5. And I don't know that, you know, I think it's a very strict target. I think that's very difficult. Um, but, uh, it's a little bit higher in women, but still, I think that's quite strict. And, and that just goes to show that we have to work very hard um, to protect ourselves. Um, Auntie, you wanted me to talk about stress, and I, and I think it's really important. We live very stressful lives. Um, there's job stress, there's stress at home, there's stress um, that we take on that may not be necessary sometimes, um, financial stress uh, in this day and age. And it does increase the risk of cardiovascular disease in general. Um, often it's more concerning because it's a trigger. So we know someone gets really angry all of a sudden um, and it triggers a cardiac event. I'm not sure if you can see this, but um, the biggest stress actually, this surprised me, is not job strain or, or things like that, but it's extreme stress in childhood. So we need to be careful with our children um, and, and protect them as much as we can. That's the highest risk. Doubles your risk of having cardiovascular disease, extreme stress in childhood. And job strain does increase your risk, but not significantly. It does. I think it's definitely contributing. Um, but we also still need to think about exercise. Um, but the trigger is a problem. So if you get, you know, um, anger, emotion, bereavement, often that leads to, to issues. And your doctors will do, um, uh, have ways of calculating your risk. So this year, the Australian CBD risk calculator was released and you can actually plug in your numbers if you Google uh, that, but often it's better to done, be done with the GP. Um, and you can work out what your risk of having a heart attack is in the next five to 10 years. But I would counsel you that you need to think about your risk in 10, 15 years, 20 years as well. Even if you're low risk, it doesn't mean that you have a free pass. So what are the steps um, that I can leave you with? Everyone over the age of 30 in this room can have a heart health check with their GP. Um, sorry, over the age of 45. And if you're uh, if you have diabetes, over the age of 35. So if you're over the age of 45, you really should have had a heart health check. And it's a 20 minute appointment. They'll do an ECG, they'll talk to you about your risk factors. Um, it shouldn't be a discussion when you go to have, uh, you know, get a cold checked out or script filled and you, you talk about this. You need to make the time to, it's like doing maintenance on your car, like Uncle said. Okay. Uh, look at practical substitutions that you can make in your diet. Sit less, move more, 8,500 steps, and don't ignore warning signs is um, the advice that I will give. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. What I want to ask is, uh, most of our age people, we are, came from Sri Lanka and we have our experience with new in Sri Lanka or sub, uh, subculture. People are afraid of getting our health because our employer may be affect our employment of employment making or it may affect our next job. Yeah. So people are getting reluctant to go to a doctor or doctor medical checkup because that result or during the medical checkup need for the new employment, they uh, they are reluctant to do what they may reveal some. I just want to elaborate on this one. Yeah, that's it. Can you hear me? Very good question, Uncle. Um, so the first thing is, yes, there are certain jobs that uh, you cannot do if you have certain heart conditions. You can't be a truck driver or have a commercial license if you have certain function in your heart or if you've had certain abnormal electrical heart rhythm. So it is a concern. But in general, um, heart disease is not often a contraindication. It doesn't stop you from doing much at work. And often, um, as a medical professional, I don't actually communicate with um, uh, employers. So it's quite formal if they want any information and you need permission from the patient. And I think in, in, in most cases, especially if you work in a office job, I don't think it's completely necessary to just, you, you know, you have to decide after talking to your own physicians, your GP, um, your specialist about what needs to be disclosed. Often, you know, people can go back to commercial drug driving after four weeks after having had a heart attack. So, Often is not a big problem. Other questions? Mm 
Yeah, I think um, the wearable technology has really improved. It offers lots of opportunities and, and also lots of challenges. Um, so the opportunity is that all of a sudden you have access to someone's um, kind of daily routine, daily data. You have access to things like step count, sleep cycles and sleep patterns, um, and you also have a heart rhythm monitoring cap uh, capabilities. The olden technologies use plasma seismography. So they looked at the pulse rate and they looked at the irregularities of the pulse rate to determine whether you have any irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, which is, I think, what everyone's concerned and looking for. Um, the newer technologies can do ECGs. So uh, you can do single lead ECGs by putting your finger um, onto the dock of an Apple Watch or Samsung equivalent. Um, and now you can actually do multi-lead ECGs. So you can almost do a 12 lead ECG of the heart by controlling your body into different positions and, and touching it from different parts of your body. But um, often I think it needs to be done with consultation with your um, medical team. And also you've got to realize not to overdiagnose. We have a tendency to overdiagnose and overworry. We find irregular heart rhythms which aren't atrial fibrillation, um, like irregular heartbeats, which lead to CT scans and angiograms and sometimes stents that weren't a problem. So I think we need to be really conscious of how we use the data. And I think it also offers opportunities for engineers because a lot of work on, on, on this big data that we're finally getting from patients. So lots of data um, and how to interpret it uh, and not just look clinically at little points of the data. I think it's really exciting. And I think there's lots of opportunities um, and the field is really moving forward with collaboration between cardiologists and engineers. In Westmead Hospital, there's an engineering lab, cardiology engineering lab, where engineers and cardiologists sit together side by side and they work on, on um, certain projects. And I think it's really exciting. Any other questions? That's a, it was a nice presentation. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. We being coming from Sri Lanka, we have a lot of concern and taste towards the coconut oil. Yes. Okay? There are a lot of hereditary theories to acknowledge the coconut oil currently. I think lately, I think everybody's saying coconut oil is a good product to be can consume back as in Sri Lanka. So, if you could uh, clarify the cardiologist for this position, and also, I would like to also put another thing that uh, consuming a glass of wine or having some liquor is good for the heart. Most of people say okay, when I believe too. <laughs> so, again, you may clarify that. And also, people suggest that the calcium score test be done. Okay, so can you also mention something about the calcium score test, please? Yeah, three very good questions. Uh, the alcohol, uh, I'll address first. I'm not sure that. So there were studies that were done that showed this J curve. So they basically showed you with a glass or two. Um, that you had a slightly reduced risk of having heart disease or heart attacks, and then as you started to drink more again, it started to rise. So, you know, no one drinking and suddenly drinking a little bit, it dropped. And then as you drank more, your risk increased again. Um, I don't know that it's good for the heart, but I don't think it's bad for the heart to drink within recommended limits, um, which are two standard drinks. Um, and that's standard drinks, um, which is not often what we drink, um, with at least two alcohol-free days in the week. And that's the recommendation. With regards to coconut oil, it is controversial, and I'm not abreast with all the data. The Heart Foundation at the moment suggests that coconut oil is not a healthy one. Not that it's bad for the heart, but they don't say it's a, it's a healthier option as you could take uh, with using, say, vegetable uh, canola oils and olive oils in particular. 
But I think as a community, we do consume quite a lot of coconut products and um, I don't see that changing. I think it's just about managing um, how we consume and, and managing with moderation. There are some data and some assertions that it is beneficial, but I'm not sure that it's been proven conclusively either way. That would be difficult to comment. The third question is probably the most interesting of all your questions because calcium scores are all the rage at the moment. And there's a lot of discussion about this on you know, Talkback Radio. And some GPs are doing them, some uh, lots of cardiologists are doing them. What is a calcium score? Okay, so a calcium score is basically when someone does a CT of your heart, they don't put any contrast in through the arteries. In fact, I did a, I showed a picture of one. So if I go back, um, yeah, right? And they look for all these bright white areas. And this is white calcium that deposited in the artery. This is not blockages. So often what happens is you get deposition of cholesterol, not just within the wall that gets into the lumen that causes blockages and heart pain, but also just stays within the wall. And what we know is that certain calcium scores suggest a higher risk. It all comes down to risk. And calcium scores are very beneficial when, they, when you use them to determine risk. Okay, so if I know that someone has diabetes and smokes and has um, high blood pressure, and I know I need to put them on a cholesterol tablet and, and manage their blood pressure, then the calcium score is not going to add much information. I already know that they're at high risk. But there are some people who don't have many risk factors at all, like the 28 or 30, 30 year old, you know, other people that you mentioned, and may have a strong family history, for example. Uh, or they may have a cholesterol that's high, but nothing else wrong with them. So they have a cholesterol of six and everything else is pristine and they exercise. And it's those intermediate cases where calcium scores are helpful. It's after someone has already looked at your risk and said, I plugged in your numbers, your cholesterol, your blood pressure and everything. And I think you're at a medium risk. So we think of low risk, less than 5%, medium risk between five and 15, five and yeah, and higher than uh, 15, the high risk. High risk people need to be on cholesterol tablets regardless of their cholesterol and need to have really aggressive modification. You target a lower level of cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. Those medium ones, if you want to give yourself some time and say, look, I'll give you some, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months, let's do a calcium score and see. If the calcium score is very high, 200, uh, like more than 400 or 300 to 400, or it's high for your age, and sex. So you basically get a calcium score and it tells you if I took 100 people of your age and sex, you'd be in the 75th highest. That's a problem. But if I took 100 of you and you're on the 25th or 10th, it's not a problem. It actually suggests that maybe you don't need tablet. So they're helpful in when you're unsure. There's no real data yet that shows that just doing calcium scores in everyone is of benefit. People are trying to prove it. So there's studies ongoing where they're doing calcium scores in everyone, but it hasn't been shown. The problem is people see a high calcium score, especially cardiologists, and they get worried that they're going to miss something. So then they do a stress test and they do a CT scan. Then they find a 70% blockage. Then they need to do an angiogram. And then suddenly you've had an angiogram. And then the angiogram kind of looks like it's 80%. And then suddenly you get a stent that you may not have needed. Or you get a complication from the angiogram that you had that you may not have needed. So it's about picking who gets a calcium score, which is a difficult point, and also knowing what to do with the data and not just jumping to conclusions. It's actually quite interesting and difficult. But I don't think everyone should have one, but there are certain people. The ones who are unsure. Sri Lankans, we know, according to the current new guidelines, if you're unsure, we think about bumping you up to the higher one. If you're like 14%, we generally bump you up to the higher one rather than leaving them uh, intermediate. Yes, what the we do? Uh, if someone, how can someone identify that I'm going on a heart attack or heart failure? How we can feel that one and when should dial privacy? So it's the classic one you must always dial is central pain, squeezing pain, pain that feels like someone or something is sitting on your chest, difficult to breathe. Some people say, oh, look, it's like a tightness. It's a discomfort, it's not a pain. You know, pain means different things to different people. 
pain that radiates to the arm, pain that radiates to the back, pain associated with difficulty breathing and sweatiness, that's a triple zero no matter how long you wait, okay? But then there is nuance because some people get indigestion pains, which could be heart pains. Um, pains that kind of come and then go away, uh, you might have time then, if it, if it lasts for a few seconds or you know 30 seconds, you might have time to go see your family doctor the next day. Um, or and then maybe see a specialist after you depends on risk and things like that. But you know, the classic pain you must go. The non-classic pain you have to be careful and vigilant. And know if it's coming back, you go. If it's lasting for more than 5, 10, 15 minutes, you go. Okay. And it's better often to be safer than than sorry. Often sometimes you it's diagnosis so basically understands about uh, you know the like asthma and that kind of situation versus how that can help um, how would you a uh, general person understand the reason and the kind of response kind of situation it's a good question and often the the doctor who sees the patient doesn't know either because lots of things can cause chest pain there's many things in our body in that area when we feel pain in that region we think about our heart but you also have bones and ribs and cartilage that can cause pain, especially after a viral illness. Um, you can have a pneumonia or infection in the chest um, that can cause pain. If you have an exacerbation or worsening of your asthma, that can make it difficult to breathe. Um, if you can have a blood clot in your lungs after a long flight, that can cause pain. Um, and it's difficult. But if it's a new symptom that's unusual for you, I think often it's better to be safe. Um, and, and especially if it lasts. Especially if you have risk factors, um, I think that's when you need to start thinking about uh, seeking help. Again, doctor. Uh, again, the pain is being confused with muscle patients, and that's where we miss the aim. Uh, so, just maybe a silly question Is there are any other complicated kind of things, or is there under the research? that can differentiate uh, the pains okay, by a blood test. So, uh, you mentioned about the other blood test, but yeah. it's a hormone release. Yeah. Uh, but then home level, what we get? Oh, is there anything? I wish there was. I don't know that there is a, a test we can do at home. And maybe in the future, with our wearable technology, you'll be able to do an ECG at home and then a machine algorithm reads the ECG and tells you whether or not you're having a heart attack. But also, you could have a heart attack with a normal ECG. It's very difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult for the, the specialist doctor. So it's even more difficult for the lay person. So I think it's it's hard to, to tell you there's this pain that means you need to go to hospital and there's this pain that means you stay home because everyone's interpretation of what pain is is different. So there's no prescription for such. Dr. have a, a question. Yeah. Yeah. from the online audience. So that person asked, if someone nearly got a heart attack, what are the things that we can save his or her life? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, uh, often there are people in the community who have been trained in um, uh, life support and basic life support and advanced life support. Very helpful uh, if you have the time to pursue that kind of training, uh, especially if you have children. Um, it's important that you seek help immediately. That's the biggest thing. Uh, in Australia, the Australian triple zero in Sri Lanka, I'm not specifically sure on the logistics, but it's about getting your person who's very sick to help quite quickly, um, as quick as possible. You want to get an idea of how sick they are. So um, you can often tell by looking at a person how sick they are. The person who looks very pale and white, they look like they're going to pass out. They look like they're going to faint. You don't want to stand them up and walk them. You lie them down. Um, you know, you have to sit them down and lie them down flat. Um, you know, and then it, it comes down to uh, seeking help as quick as possible. If you know that, it, I, 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 I'm reluctant to tell you know a lay person to give aspirin and things like that. I think it's best that you just seek help. Um, there's really more that you can do when someone's having quite a significant heart attack and getting them to help as quick as possible. If if it's a patient who no, has known heart disease and takes um, you know uh, the spray, what I tell patients if they have chest pain and they have the spray is to to sit on a chair before you use it because you can drop your blood pressure. 
use one spray under the tongue um, and you wait. And then if in you know, two, three, four minutes, you still have the pain, you take a second spray and call for help. Uh, uh, so uh, I have a small question. So uh, when we talk about the people who had a strength or, or a heart, previously had heart attacks, so uh, especially Sri Lankan and Delhi crowd, uh, I'd say they don't work out that much. And uh, uh, it's good that you explained that why doing chose and uh, sweeping the area uh, are different from excessive uh, exercises. So uh, my question is, uh, they are very uh, reluctant to do exercises and they depend on uh, medication too much uh, as per my experiences. Uh, can you uh, just say a brief word that they yeah. see it as a problem? It's a great question. And we none of us like to take medications. Every single person that I talk to about a medication tells me I don't like to take medications. I don't generally take medications. Many people don't want to even consider a medication. Um, but also, al although, you know, we like to think that we'd like to embrace these lifestyle changes, they're not easy to do. You know, they're expensive. They take time. Healthy eating takes time and expense to plan your meal and to, to shop properly. And then to, um, you know, I when I was doing some research to this talk, I looked at ways that, um, uh, you know, reasons that are barriers to change behaviors. And often for Sri Lankan women, it's the fact that, you know, they identify the need to change their diet, but they're cooking for their community, they're cooking for their family, um, and they're cooking for, you know, they need to make sure that there's rice on the table and X, Y, Z and curries. And, and then you either have to prepare a second meal for yourself or you need to, you know, th th there are challenges in our own culture. Um, and I think it's about, to answer your question, exercise is, it's about doing it as a family unit and to, and to think about it, you know, where you support each other. And, and the studies have shown that working, uh, exercising together often helps, um, you know, talking about weight loss together as a family helps rather than uh, one person individually going on the journey. I think that would help. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you very much. Um, All right, thank you very much. Um, so on behalf of the IESL and SW, uh, I would like to extend my heart and gratitude for, to all of you for making uh, time to be here today, especially Mr. Indonesia's family. It's good to, very good to have you here. Um, and uh, yeah, most of all to uh, our thanks go to Dr. Kasun for this timely topic. And as engineers, uh, we like we like a lot of numbers and figures and graphics. So. I, I, I thought personally that was a very you know very good presentation. Uh, you went into all the details, but you know, and at the same time you kept it very interesting, and you showed us you know like it's good to have like a reminder. Um, we start chasing stuff you know from uh, morning till night, and we sometimes we forget to take care of simple things. But you know, uh, thank you, thank you for that uh, reminder, and thank and and thank you for all your knowledge sharing. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, on behalf of IESL and SW chapter, thank you very much for making uh, time to be here today. I uh, we, we all know, like, you know, uh, you must be very busy with your professional and uh, family commitments. So we really appreciate you uh, making the time uh, for us. And also, thanks go to Mr. Cicero for um, bringing the idea to do this uh, uh, presentation on this timely topic. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, also, I would like to thank our past chairs uh, in the audience and uh, also the uh, IESL NSW uh, committee, your encouragement uh, and help uh, with our activities uh, uh, encourage us a lot. Thank you very much for being here. And last but not least, uh, I would like to uh, extend our gratitude to the Indian Australia administration and the uh, staff uh, uh, for all the um, help with the coordination, audiovisual equipment and such. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, hopefully we all 
see you at the uh, next session, uh, which we promise to be informative as today. Thank you very much. Um, drive safe. <laughs>